In this lecture, we'll continue our discussion of model updating by talking about modal parameter sensitivities and how those um, can be computed. We'll derive those and how those can be used as a tool in model updating. Remember that we spoke last time about um, expressing the model updating or optimization problem as y is a, a function of alpha. y were our state variables, like the natural frequencies, and alpha are the design variables, things like the stiffness of the joint, the modulus, the um, thicknesses of parts, other properties of the finite element model that might need to be updated. So we have some real test data that gives us a known value for y, and the finite element model is this function f of alpha that we can evaluate, and it, can, it tells us for a certain set of variables, for a certain set of parameters, stiffnesses, moduli, and so on, um, what are the corresponding um, natural frequencies or mode shapes or other properties of the structure. So that's the problem we're trying to solve, and modal parameter sensitivities are a big part of enabling us to do that. So the derivation begins with the eigenvalue problem for the jth mode, which you can write this way. You might be used to seeing this term as natural frequency squared, but here I'll write that as lambda sub j. And um, so we have the mass and stiffness matrix, the eigenvector j. I'm using Kammer's notation with psi for the eigenvector. And um, we're going to take the derivative of this with respect to the um, parameters, and I'll show you how you can use that to get the modal parameter sensitivity. But um, to do that, we'll switch over now to uh, these notes. And uh, just a reminder that uh, mass and stiffness are matrices, the mode shape is a vector, and that lambda is just a scalar. So what we want to know is how are the modes going to change with respect to a design parameter. Again, alpha sub r could be a thickness, could be a modulus, could be some other property of the structure that we're not sure about. And so if we take the derivative of this top equation, um, we have to use the chain rule because we have uh, some products here. Uh, everything actually depends on alpha. The natural frequencies, um, which are one of the properties we're after, but also the mass matrix could change with alpha if it's a density, for example. The stiffness matrix could change if alpha is a Young's modulus, for example. So anyway, we take the derivative uh, and do all the chain rules, and these are all the terms that we get. Um, and notice this last term we kept the first part constant and just took the derivative of the eigenvector. And suppose we want the, the sensitivity of the natural frequencies with respect to the parameter. Then we want to isolate that term. And we pre-multiply the whole thing by the jth eigenvector to um, because that will, or the jth eigen eigenvector transposed actually because that will take this, um, the product right here is n by n times n, uh, n by 1. So this is n by 1. And that will take that to a scalar and allow us to just solve for that sensitivity. So if we pre-multiply everything by lambda, this first term has the sensitivity that we're after. Um, plus, we also have... Um, the sensitivity of psi with, uh, we have this triple product that's a scalar, and if the modes are mass normalized, that's just one. I suppose I should also um, mention here one thing that might not be obvious is that remember that lambda is equal to the natural frequency squared. So if we take the derivative of both sides with respect to alpha, So d lambda r, and I guess I should write that as omega r, over um, d alpha. And I guess these are actually partial derivatives because we could have um, other sensitivities in there. 
Okay, so that would be 2 omega r um, times times the partial of omega r with respect to alpha r. Right, so we just took the omega r squared, we take the derivative of that, gives 2 omega r, and then this is the derivative of the inside. So once we get done, we're going to convert this sensitivity into a natural frequency sensitivity using um, this equation. And then, you know, to go from the rth natural frequency um, to the, in hertz to the rth natural frequency in radians per second, we just use that conversion. Okay, so anyway, um, well, uh, so we, we pre-multiplied, we made this first term a nice convenient scalar. Um, these terms um, stay messy, so we group those together. But notice that this is a scalar, but it does depend on how on the, the n by n matrix, which is the derivative of every element of the mass matrix with respect to the parameter of interest. A lot of those are going to be zeros, but it's still a, an n by n matrix. All right, and then on the this term here, we get lambda or er, psi transpose times this term, and then our derivative of psi, and we notice that this term is conveniently zero, and the reason for that is if we took it's a scalar, we can take the transpose of the whole term, and if we do, we see that this part right here is just the eigenvalue problem that we started with, because these matrices are symmetric. And as a result, we're going to have a vector transposed into a zero vector. And so this whole term right here just vanishes. And um, that makes uh, life a lot easier. So um, we're able to isolate the sensitivity that we want, and it's given by this expression. All right. And so what about these um, sensitivities right here, K, uh, these, uh, the change in the stiffness matrix with respect to a parameter? We can usually write those as um, in a matrix form as a summation. This is like a Taylor series form. But basically, we can say that our, our stiffness matrix is the nominal stiffness matrix plus the derivative of the stiffness matrix with respect to a parameter times um, delta theta, times the change in that parameter. To really make sense of this, we probably need an example. So let's take this nice little two degree of freedom system. Uh, two masses, two springs. We used this in the last lecture. And if we wanted the Jacobian with respect to K2, then the derivative of that whole stiffness matrix with respect to k2, um, notice right here we just get a 1, right? Here we get a negative 1, negative 1, 1. The k1 is completely ignored in that. So, um, so that Jacobian is just given by this matrix. And um, now, if we wanted the stiffness matrix as we change the parameter k2, we could just take our original matrix right up there, and we can add to it the change in the parameter, the change in k2 divided uh, times this matrix. And if we add those together, what we get is this. And notice that in each term, we just have, um, we have the new, we've replaced the old stiffness with the new stiffness. And this same thing would work even if we had a much bigger system. Um, you know, say we had a, a three degree of freedom system, or actually it could be even bigger. Um, in this case, this, this would allow us to isolate just the spring of interest and focus on it. Okay, the other one thing that's nice uh, and helpful here, and notice um, if we have typical units, you know, these masses might be in kilograms, um, and the stiffnesses will be in like newtons per meter. 
So these stiffnesses can be like on the order of like 10 to the ninth or something like that, while the masses might be in the order of thousands or something. So um, there's big differences in units, and that can really throw off the optimization. So often we want to write our design variables normalized. We do that by dividing the design variable, so this would be like our, our k2 value, right? We divide that by k2 nominal, whatever the nominal value of k2 is. And so that gives us something on the order of 1. So if we do that, um, then we can replace the change in the parameter with a normalized change in the parameter. And the difference is just this division by the nominal parameter. So if we go back to our matrix equation and we just multiply that derivative matrix we had above by the nominal parameter, then we convert the variable to be the normalized change in the parameter. And so these are the matrices we're going to go forward with. This matrix is just um, the Jacobian that we had above times the nominal parameters. And this allows us to put things in this convenient form. OK, so in our example, this is really simple. Basically, our new matrix is just K2 times that Jacobian that we had up above. And so if we want to decrease K2 by 50%, we would let, um, we would let alpha we would let alpha r be equal to um, be equal to 0.5. So this should actually say um, alpha r, and so delta alpha delta alpha r is equal to alpha r minus alpha r zero, which is just one in all cases. So if you do this, um, what we will get is 50% or we'll take away half of the stiffness out of each of these terms there. So we could use this same approach for, um, for the mass matrix. And even in a finite element model where, you know, say we had a finite element model of a beam and maybe our updating parameter is the height of the beam, you can actually write the elemental stiffness matrix for you know, each finite element of that beam. Um, and in there, you know, there will be some equations you know, that will have things like EH. You, know, um, you might have a moments of inertia. Anyway, there will be all kinds of terms in there. And when you derive the element, you can figure out uh, where the parameters of interest are. And you can actually derive these Jacobian matrices. And so some finite element codes are smart enough to know how to compute that derivative, partial k, partial whatever parameter you're interested in. All right, so we'll shift gears a little bit now. Um, one, other, one good finite element example I wanted to cover is if we have a finite element model of an isotropic material with an isotropic material and just a single material, then you can usually, in every case that I know of at least, you can show that the stiffness matrix is equal to the Young's modulus times some non-dimensional stiffness matrix. So you can, uh, if you just put in one for your Young's modulus, you'll get uh, this K matrix. And that would be need to be multiplied by the Young's modulus. And you could try this in NASTRAN and see how this works. Similarly, um, the mass matrix is proportional to the density. So if we just insert that the density is equal to one, then um, we'll get this non-dimensional um, non-dimensional mass matrix. Now, this is the eigenvalue problem we want to solve right here that has the units in it. But if we put um, ones in for E and rho, this is the one that the FE code will solve. 
So um, actually, it's going to be equal to zero still. And so then um, equating terms here, we can see that the lambdas that we get from the Fe will be related to the natural frequencies that we're interested in in this way. So we can just solve for those uh, like that. And um, we, get, uh, we get good numerical conditioning, which is good for the code. And we get natural frequencies out just by doing this simple multiplication. And then if you um, want to change the modulus, all you have to do is take your natural frequencies and multiply them by this number. You don't have to go rerun the code to change modulus or density. Um, oh, it looks like there's a um, typo here. That should be omega. Um, it looks like there shouldn't be those squares there. OK, um, another thing that's important to recognize here um, is that um, we don't ever need to uh, vary both the Young's modulus and the density, um, because we're going to get results out that are exactly reciprocal to each other. If we ever include both E and rho as updating parameters, if we have both of them in our updating problem, we're going to um, have these two fighting each other and we'll never be able to get an answer. So what's almost always done in practice is to measure the mass or get some estimate of mass, take the density as a fixed parameter, and then usually we'll let the Young's modulus um, uh, take care, be the variable parameter in the updating. OK, and if, if that was the case, our eigenvalue sensitivity formula becomes really simple. It's just um, the derivative of this equation with respect to Young's modulus. And lambda doesn't depend at all on that if we use a non-dimensional finite element model. So the derivative um, would just be given by this expression. So um, super easy to do. Um, one thing people sometimes ask is, why is the Young's modulus even variable? I mean, can I just go put it in an instron? But it's important to remember that uh, Young's modulus could be capturing a lot of things. It could be capturing the fact that our mesh is always, you know, almost always too stiff. We usually can't use enough elements to get the um, mesh size to be totally negligible. And um, we also have to approximate the geometry. Um, you know, um, there are all kinds of things that are captured there, including the, the material variation, which, you know, sometimes people say for metals, which are pretty well known, you know, this still might be on the order of 10%. If you're talking polymers, you know, it could be, uh, you know, it might even be a factor of two uncertainty or something like that. And rubbers, you know, there can be orders of magnitude uncertainties. Okay, now that we have all of that um, laid out, now we can start to tackle optimization. We have our state variables, our model parameters, and now we can formulate a problem that says our goal is to find a set of parameters that minimize the difference between our measured natural frequencies and our model's natural frequencies. And Often we do this with a weighting matrix A that's usually diagonal. Um, so the actual, um, the actual cost function that we're trying to minimize, the objective function, is given by this equation. And um, um, an example of this, again, our two degree of freedom example, if we have we have two modes that we could measure, so if we knew two natural frequencies, what we might use for our weighting matrix would be the reciprocal of the natural frequency squared. If we do that, um, then this will weight changes in each of the natural frequencies uh, equally. So this is basically um, weighting the percent error in the natural frequencies. That's often what we want to do um, 
you know, a two hertz change in a thousand hertz mode is not as big of a deal as a two hertz change in a 10 hertz mode. Um, okay. So um, if we do that and we plug this A matrix in up here, that equation just boils down to the difference between the first natural frequency and its measured value squared over the nominal first natural frequency. And this could also be the measured one, actually, both of these. And then we could have the difference in the um, second natural frequency over the um, nominal squared. So, um, so that's our objective function, and we can start to do optimization. So I have a MATLAB example in this function. So let's take a look at that. Um, so this is that same two degree of freedom system that we've been looking at. We calculate the nominal natural frequencies. And um, let's just run this first part. And so, um, let's see, I'm just gonna clear and run that again so we can just have a cleaner picture. So these are the nominal natural frequencies. And um, suppose we start, um, actually, let's start with this case. All right, so we'll start uh, with the case where we have a 50% error initially in the uh, first net in the first stiffness value and a 50% uh, so 50 negative there 57% positive in k2 so the nominal k1 and k2 are just one so um, we do that and these are the nominal natural frequencies in our model and the measured ones are here those are the ones um, that we would get if we ran the model with, um, oh, okay, sorry, this is the nominal model, yep. All right, um, so it's a little confusing the way I've written the code here, but um, these are our measured natural frequencies, which are equal to the natural frequencies in the true model right here. So I was thinking Fn0 is my initial, but that's actually the true model. Um, okay, I define my weighting matrix to be one over, or to be the a diagonal matrix with those natural frequencies squared on the diagonal. And then um, I defined the objective function in a MATLAB function. And so um, what this does is it takes in alpha, which are the, in this case, I'm just using um, the stiffnesses as my values. And so K1 and K2 are directly the values. I'm not using normalized variables in this example. But um, I build the stiffness matrix from those I solve the eigenvalue problem, I get the natural frequencies. Here I make sure they're sorted. Now in a real problem, you'd have a lot more complicated code here because you'd actually have to use orthogonality or MAC or something to plot um, how this progresses. And then um, or to plot and make sure you match up the frequencies. Okay, and then I calculate the objective function and fmin search is then going to um, try to minimize that objective function by starting with these starting guesses for the parameters by varying them. I think it's, um, so it solves super fast. Um, in no time, it has optimal natural frequencies that nearly match those. And it's found, it's satisfied the objective function down to a tolerance of 10, 2 to the minus 10 and the stiffnesses that it found are almost identical to the true ones, to several digits, right? I think it's interesting to actually like watch this, how it progresses. So if we um, run this again, 
these are all the steps that um, Fmin search is taking. I didn't label the axes, but this is K, uh, let's see, K2 and K1 down here. And so it's dancing all around, trying all kinds of stiffness values, and eventually it converges here near the 1, 1 point. So um, pretty cool, right? It's, it's able to do that. Um, this doesn't require any objective function at all. This, this is, or this doesn't require any gradients at all. Fmin search is a gradient-free algorithm. So um, it, it knows how to tackle the problem. It's, it does, um, it uses a nelder mead algorithm, which is, you know, basically takes steps in different directions and tries things and chases down the minimum. So um, there's also an Fmin Khan example that you can run here. With Fmin Khan, you can actually pass in the Jacobian matrices, but I didn't. Um, I didn't actually. Um, um, I didn't actually um, implement that here yet. So here it's still having to find its own gradients. And you can also give it bounds. The constraints are the bounds on the parameters. So you can tell it what, uh, what range you think those parameters are actually in. I want to just run this one one more time now um, with larger errors. Now we're a factor of 100 off on K1 and a factor of 20 off on K2. And let's just see what happens here. So in this case, um, oops. Got to close that figure first. Let's run it again. In this case, we started way farther out from the true value. And so the algorithm jumps around quite a bit, struggles a lot more. It eventually gets K1 near, or K2, sorry, K2 nearly dialed in. And once it does, it starts to realize the problem it has with K1 and eventually dials that in. So it takes it a lot more iterations. But it does eventually solve, and it does come up with pretty accurate K1, K2 again. And the natural frequencies match almost perfectly. OK, so this is um, an example of um, derivative free. Um, let's, let's look now at what happens. Um, oh, running it one more time. OK, now let's look at how we can use these um, gradients. This little cell illustrates something interesting. Um, oh, sorry, yeah, this version of MATLAB has a bug where it um, All right, this version has a little bug where my control enter button doesn't work. But I've never got around to reinstalling it, so. Okay, so I'm just gonna have to run it this way. Um, oh, okay, yeah, actually, now I remember what's going wrong here. Sorry, this just becomes too painful with this part uncopied to wait for it to run all those iterations. OK. Now if we run this again, what this plots is the objective function, the error in the natural frequencies, that norm of the error, versus the stiffness k1. And this kind of gives you a hint as to what's going on in that one case. Um, so there, this is a nonlinear function, um, which is why you know even a gradient-based algorithm would take several iterations to get there. But um, you can imagine that if we get close enough, um, perhaps this becomes well approximated as a parabola, and a linear gradient might give us a good estimate of the um, the stiffness in this region. So that Jacobian could really help us to solve this more accurately. So um, this part shows you how to compute a Jacobian, Jacobian numerically. 
um, we we derive the um, just to remind you what we're doing here we derived we derive these matrices um, k prime but we still have to plug those in um, to an equation for the eigenvalue sensitivity. Oh, where is it? Right there. Oh, sorry, that's over here. We still have to plug it into this equation in order to calculate how the natural frequencies change um, due to a change in a parameter. Okay, so anyway, um, what we can do is uh, I define a function that um, is the square root of the eigenvalue of, of the solution to the eigenvalue problem. So I did this all in one line. This is the square root of i of k comma m. So this doesn't do any, and it also sorts them too, just in case. So um, this is our f of alpha. And so we can we can take whatever our initial point is that we're going to about, uh, linearize about and calculate the Jacobian about. And then the finite difference Jacobian is just um, f of alpha um, plus some perturbation uh, minus f of alpha without the perturbation. And then we divide by the perturbation. So the first column, I vary the first stiffness by 0.01. The second column, I vary the second stiffness by 0.01. And um, if we run this, what we get um, are, is this Jacobian matrix. And this matrix tells us uh, how each of the natural frequencies will change, the first natural frequency in the first row, the second natural frequency in the second, if we apply, um, if we change the stiffness um, k1 or k2. So um, this is a numerical estimate of that Jacobian. So with finite differences, I get this estimate for the Jacobian using the formulas that we just derived. These are our k primes. Um, we can find the initial eigenvalues. And then um, I, I loop over the eigenvalues because that formula that we derived applies for each of the eigenvalues. So this is d lambda d alpha. And it's phi transpose, or psi it was in the common notation, psi transpose. The, the M term was zero, so it's just this DK matrix here, and then Psi again. Yeah, there's the full formula. Um, so we just loop over both of the modes. Um, this gives us, um, this gives us the D lambdas, and then I convert those into Hertz using the, um, the conversion that we talked about um, earlier. Let me just flip back to there and remind you. Um, we can convert lambda to omega by solving this equation. So we get a 1 over 2 omega r, and then we're also going to need a 2 pi in there. Okay, so anyway, um, that gives us the change in the natural frequency with respect to alpha. And then um, um, so we have the numerical finite difference gradient. These are the ones calculated using the approach that we derived. And notice that they agree really well. It's hard to look at these and make much sense of them. So what I did here is I took the um, initial natural frequencies and I added to it the Jacobian. And then I made a 20% change to each of those variables. And let's see how close those estimated frequencies are to the true ones, so where if I actually evaluate the model with plus and minus 20% changes in the stiffnesses. So here I uh, print those all out. So these are the initial frequencies that we get. 
if we perturb the stiffness is 20 percent this these are the frequencies we should get and using the Jacobian to estimate that these are the ones that we do get and notice they work really really well um, so this is just an illustration of how you can use these analytical Jacobians in a problem if we wanted to feed these into f min con we would have to um, take one step more we'll talk later about this but and um, convert the the objective function find the derivative of the objective function with respect to the the alpha value the delta alpha values so this shows um, how we would actually do that both numerically and using the equation so we'll derive that um, next time but anyway this shows you um, that this Jacobian can be a useful estimate of the function in a local region and what it's doing um, this is the objective function so it's the square but it, um, what we're doing is we're taking the natural if this was the natural frequency um, versus the parameter so if we had a plot of the natural frequency versus say k2 so whatever that function is we're approximating its derivative at some point and so for a certain region around that point this approximation can be acceptably good and it can be used to help us figure out what value of k2 we need to get a certain measured natural frequency okay so that's it for this lecture we'll be back to talk about some more advanced concepts